earlier in the conflict, Vladimir Putin was threatening nuclear weapons use, and we haven't heard that uh, recently. Uh, and so I think I, you know, I, the concerns about what type of weapons uh, should be given to the Ukrainians has changed over time because sometimes early in the conflict, Republicans were saying, give the Ukrainians much more than they had gotten. Uh, and now they, there's some Republicans who say, don't give them as much. Uh, and there is some thinking among military experts that if we had given these types of weapons a long time ago to the Ukrainians, then they would not be in a stalemate right now. The use um, for the first time this week uh, by Ukraine of these uh, long-range uh, tactical ballistic missiles, the aptly named Atakums that the US has given to Ukraine, that they have fired into Russian-held territory. Um, I know that uh, Vladimir Putin has today said that this is a big mistake by the US to give these um, weapons to Ukraine, a big sort of step up. And Putin's framed this, uh, as I understand it, as, you know, the US getting even more deeply involved in the war uh, in Ukraine. I just wondered, is that a sort of narrative that gains any grist on the ground uh, domestically in the US, that they are getting in too deeply with Ukraine by giving these kind of um, very serious and next level weapons? That is definitely has been a concern, but the U.S. government and the Biden administration has been pretty careful to not go too far in terms of uh, uh, provoking Putin. And we don't want to get in a hot, cold war, a uh, hot third war, in World War Three with uh, Vladimir Putin. I uh, don't want to get into a nuclear exchange. Earlier in the conflict, Vladimir Putin was threatening nuclear weapons use, and we haven't heard that uh, recently. Uh, and so I think I, you know, I, the concerns about what type of weapons uh, should be given to the Ukrainians has changed over time because sometimes early in the conflict, Republicans were saying, give the Ukrainians much more than they had gotten. Uh, and now they, there's some Republicans who say, don't give them as much. Uh, and there is some thinking among military experts that if we had given these types of weapons a long time ago to the Ukrainians, then they would not be in a stalemate right now. Um, hi, Daniel. I was wondering to what extent there's an anxiety about fighting two or being involved in two long wars, if you like, on two continents with, after Netanyahu's statement today, whether Biden is actually wanting some kind of distraction from the sort of domestic troubles that um, we're seeing in Washington, the chaos there. Yeah, I think the chaos has... Uh, made it harder for the Congress to give important weapons to Israel and uh, Ukraine. Uh, I think it's um, in terms of whether, uh, you know, we see a um, kind of a, a two-front war, there's a lot of Ukrainian military officials who are worried that the ammunition that they want will be diverted to the Israelis from the U.S. And so uh, they're just the Pentagon has a team of senior officers who are scouring our weapons caches and trying to find stuff that would go for Israel. But Israel's military is already pretty well supplied uh, as it is um, with supplies in Israel. And so they might not need as much as um, we're giving to the Ukrainians by far. And Ukraine is it's a much different situation when it's Hamas versus uh, Russia. In a, well, just, uh, just a few hours' time, President Biden's going to be addressing the American people on, on live TV. He's got a plan in his back pocket to, well, to try to keep the money going towards Ukraine, to support Ukraine in its war against the, the Russian invader, as well as updating the American people on the, on the crisis in Gaza and Israel. Fact is, there are, there are big questions in the air. If that funding for Ukraine comes into serious doubt, as, as it might on the, in, the, in the House of Representatives on Capitol Hill in Washington, there's a body of, uh, of Republican Party opinion that is deeply sceptical about continuing to fund, fund Ukraine. The president may well come up with a, a plan to keep that fund going, but there's an election just around the corner and a, a contender for the White House, Donald Trump, who again would be a big challenge to uh, support for Ukraine. While all that is in the air, we can all see it. It's in plain view, Lucy uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and Rachel. It's a challenge for European leaders. They have to be ready to step up don't they? They have to be planning, but you don't get any sense of a lot of planning going on, Lucy. 
No, you don't. Uh, and, and this is something that has struck me a lot speaking to British European diplomats, that there doesn't appear um, particularly a lot of plan planning going on right now for uh, Donald Trump potentially w winning the presidency and what that means for the future of NATO. You know, we know he has an antipathy or at least ambivalence towards the alliance. Uh, it came out sort of partly during his presidency, more details afterwards, how close he came to withdrawing the US uh, altogether. And given even, you know, just on every sort of metric of the sort of the leadership, um, the funding, the hardware that the US provide, it is just so uh, important to that alliance that I am really surprised there isn't more a uh, desperate sort of flurry of planning going on behind closed doors in European capitals. Mm. Macron has sort of tried to make the argument for more sort of European strategic or non autonomy. That's been rebuffed as typical French, you yeah. know, uh, bid to take the lead. And um, there aren't, you know, there isn't much talk about the European defence force, this idea that gets sort of um, kicked around from time to time. I am interested that after the sort of the big conversation, Ben Wallace, the former UK Defence Secretary, trying to throw his hat in the ring to become the next uh, General Secretary of NATO, that they decided to stick with Jens Stoltenberg. Um, again, I think it was his third or fourth extension of term, in part, no doubt, because he is seen as this amazing Trump whisperer. Um, so to me, that seems that, that the, the key challenge is if Trump gets in. Mm. I think interestingly, although there has been um, concerns about the, the, the US um, budget getting through through aid to Ukraine in the short term. I've been struck by British politicians who've been out to the US say, actually, on Capitol Hill, there isn't that much worry. They do think that the, the vast bulk of the Republican Party is still behind Ukraine at the moment. So it doesn't seem as much alarm as perhaps um, some of the headlines suggest. Yeah, still a case for planning. I mean, there were fault lines in Europe. Hungary, for example, Viktor Orban. Of course. He's very openly sympathetic to the Russian side of this. I think he was pictured shaking hands with yeah. Vladimir Putin. And, and Poland and Slovakia Pol also saying they're not going to give new exactly. weapons to You've got France and Poland, if you like, on the... Poland had a bit of a spat with Ukraine, but it doesn't amount to any weakening of support. But France, Poland, Germany, and of course the UK, Rachel. I mean, how does the UK fit into this? If, if the time comes for European leaders to, to take up the slack, Britain is not part of a, a very particular bloc apart from NATO. How does it fit in there and exert the sort of leadership that the Prime Minister would no doubt wish to? Yeah, I think it's hard. I think the um, we've got used in Britain to America being sort of leader of the free, free world, both financially and diplomatically and in terms of particularly defence spending. Um, and that's good. that I think now is looking much harder. And I think um, the Donald Trump... Uh, potential election uh, is causing a lot of anxiety in Whitehall that, that, you know, even if they're not preparing for it, they're thinking, what does that actually say about what would it mean for democracy as a kind of America, as this kind of... Mm champion of democracy would it's what not, would trump not, actually do with that power if he did become president it's not easy to see what preparation would look like if they were doing it actually yeah i was i was struck on one sort of caveat to, to what i was saying about preparations um not not really going on is, is last week i was interested that in the midst of everything else going on that rishi sunak traveled to um the baltic island of gotland for a meeting of the joint expeditionary force which is not a household name um, to many people, but it, I think it could become an increasingly important military alliance, defence alliance that the UK is part of. Ten nations, it's the Baltic states, the UK, the Netherlands, Iceland, a, a few others. And it feels that if there is a fracturing of NATO or if there is this concern about the US pulling out, we could see these kind of regional partnerships come to the fore a little more, 